I did, yes. I don't know. I think Marina, she's watched all your stuff. I she okay. just brought me. To- I I watched you since what uh, four years, even before COVID. When that's when I started watching you. You, Marina, are are into Section Eight, and you, Mark, are not into Section Eight. Okay. So I I think this is a good convo to have. I and- I'm from Russia. Don't scare me with anything else. <laughs> Well, I just I, I, I just want you to know what happened. you're getting into. You've answered the question for me at least from the from the section eight side, and and I'm mad enough to admit, you know, I was wrong. Um, so as usual, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the 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 real reason that you should be investing is because you can quadruple your money, right, with the loan, right? Like, I mean, you could you know invest in the stock market, right? But you can't get a loan to invest in the stock market. So that's like the true like best reason that multifamily real estate, especially in the Cleveland market is going to be uh, better than like stock investing in my opinion. Right. Cause you can, you can utilize that leverage. I just don't want to be dependent on a, on a paycheck for the rest of my day. And the first thing you told me, I said, when'd you buy it? How much did you pay for it? And the first thing I said was, holy fuck, this motherfucker's probably worth like at least seven right now. Like as a guy that makes money selling people real estate in Cleveland, I'll tell you this. You do not want to sell that property. And if your main goal is setting you guys up for retirement, this thing's an awesome asset. Because if we had the same phone call 20 years from now, I bet you that property's worth well over a million dollars. This should be the last property that you sell. Uh, How can we move forward being out of state investors what is the best way for us? What is the best area for us? What is the best strategy for us that you would advise? Everything, just like I said, gold dust, James. I really appreciate all the time. I think we both do. Um, and thanks for making me look like a chump as well. Uh, and my wife is right and I'm wrong. So. I mean, dude, you're you're already wrong the moment you walked in on the call. You're married. I mean, this is how it is, man. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> Mark, my man, how are you doing? Yeah, we're doing all right. Um, I'm, you know, we're we're trying to get things started. Um, and when when you say where, that is you and your wife. Yes, my wife and I are. Okay, what's your wife's name? Marina. 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 Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. All right. All right. What uh, What are you guys trying to get started? Like, what uh, What brings you in? What do you guys want to talk about for the next hour? We're going to just kind of go through anything and everything uh, that that you guys want to discuss about investing. Yeah, so um, I appreciate, first of all, I, I, I really appreciate you giving us the time. I know that there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on out there for you. Um, so we, both of us really do appreciate it. Um, Absolutely. Let me just give you just a little bit of background. Um so I'm working uh, out in Abu Dhabi, which is in the uh, in the Middle East, and um, we've been here for quite some time, actually. Um, and real quick, we... it's, it's it's one o'clock Eastern Standard Time where I am in Ohio. What time is it right now where you are? Nine p.m. Nine p.m. Man, jeez, getting late. I got yeah, I got no. I got little kids, man. I'd be passing out around nine. <laughs> Our, our kids are grown, so um, not not too much uh, worry there. But uh, and typically I work until about uh, three thirty in the morning my time, which is around. Okay. Okay. So, um, so the um, what we're trying to do uh, is we're we're kind of new at the well we're not kind of new we are new at the real estate investment side. Okay. Um, and. I just don't want to be dependent on a on a paycheck for the rest of my days, right? And so we want to work towards ultimately we want to work towards um, over the next few years, um, you know, kind of a a three five ten plan of where we want to be ultimately from a strategic point of view ten years from now, um, to where we can, you know, along with other things that we've done to secure that financial future, um, rely on basically mailbox money. Uh, to okay. some extent uh, okay. through real estate. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so just to clarify, so like right now, uh, the amount of money you make from your day job working uh, overseas right now, that is like your lifestyle money. That's the money you spend. 
uh, to afford the home you're living in, daily expenses, things like that. And you're trying to invest your funds in real estate uh, to set you up uh, for potentially retirement or even an early type of retirement. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. All makes sense. That's definitely something that real estate could do. How much money are you guys uh, planning on putting into your investment business, your real estate investment business? So we uh, initially on this first deal, we were considering um, paying cash and, you know, up to a hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, there's, you know, there's a lot of back and forth about should you leverage, you know, loans and should you, you know, or should you pay cash? And and I think most people are on the side of, of leveraging, but um, I think a big part of that for us is being that we're uh, overseas, it's a little bit tougher for us um, to to make the decisions on, on well, to, to kind of get mortgage loans and things like that, you got to be on U.S. soil, you know, which means, you know, I've, I've purchased before overseas and it's real pain in the butt, right? You got to go, uh, you end up going to an embassy and, and getting a bunch of stuff signed and it, getting into an embassy here is pretty difficult. So we were considering um, the first the first deal being cash. Um, okay. Like I said, up to, a, I, think, I think we both set up to a hundred grand um, or, you know, if there was two really good ones out there, I suppose, right? We could consider doing two deals, you know, with, within that hundred thousand dollar budget, but, uh, that's that's where we want to start, I think. Okay, I so I assume you guys are both U.S. citizens, then. Um, I am a U.S. citizen. My wife is not. Okay, so you're a U.S. citizen, and uh, you could qualify uh, for a thirty-year mortgage just like any other U.S. citizen would. It's just the complications of actually getting to the embassy, and we deal with people that have to go to embassies to sign documents in front of the notary all the time. Like one of the worst situations we had a seller who was in uh it was like africa and it, it it was like six weeks out to get an appointment uh for an embassy visit uh what are you guys looking because i would assume your location is is probably a little bit uh like more involved and they have more u.s citizens than where this particular person was like what is like your timeline to get to an embassy because honestly like i understand that like from a logistical standpoint, it's, it's probably like a pain in the ass. It might like extend our deal a couple of weeks, but I, I think it would be worth it. Uh, it to it's much worse than that. Sorry to cut you off there. Oh, okay. Um, but it, it's, it's much actually worse, worse than, than six weeks. So it is worse than what they're dealing with in Africa to get to embassies. Oh yeah. So okay. right now we're we're struggling just to do visa renewal, right? And and it's a it's a year plus, right? So. Oh, for my okay. wife, right. So for my wife's visa, it's, it's a year plus. So getting an appointment there right now on documents and everything else is 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 minimum three months. Okay, three months. Okay, all right. That is kind of a bummer. Problem. You could you could fly. A worst case scenario, you could fly. I mean that that can be a raise. I don't think that is uh, like a you know a bigger problem now because he can always go there and you know arrange that on 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 site there. Uh, the thing is that we really want to start somewhere right now, and we've got some, you know, proposals from here and there. And then I remembered even before COVID, I started following you, you know, following your videos and your information and everything. So I, uh, I said, let's talk to somebody who really knows this business and especially that area from inside out, who can really direct us. And that's what we're looking for right now. Okay. Well, just a couple of thoughts before we even get into properties and thank you for all that. But this is my thoughts on the, um, the financing situation, right? I think the best thing to do, right, would be definitely any deal you guys buy, uh, you're going to want to put in Mark's name, Mark's name only because Mark, you're the U.S. citizen. And then I would say what we should do is we should do this one of two ways. Option one uh, would be you buy it cash, but then from there, once you take possession of it, we'll then just contact a regular lender and you're 90 days out, let's call it 120 days out, just, just for kicks and giggles here with your embassy. That way you could buy it cash and then you'll know that in four months time, you'll be able to refi it out, get your money back, right? Because I, I don't think it would make any sense to completely like shift your total investment strategy just based on the fact that you have to wait to actually get to an embassy because like, especially you guys, you're trying to build 
like money for your retirement, right? Like, so with, with the same hundred K, like why buy one, like in Cleveland, right? It's like, you're doing a hundred K. So like, you're probably going to get like a duplex, right? So like, why buy one duplex with two rent checks for the hundred K when you can get four duplexes with eight rent checks, right? The same amount of money. So we could work through the logistical stuff of it, right? So like I said, option one, we just buy it cash and then you just refi you know, do your appointment, right? Your appointment, you get an appointment, say it's 90, 120 days out, then we'll just set it up with the the lender that that'll be when you close. Not a really big deal. Option two, uh, we could, if you don't even want to pay cash, which it sounds like you're fine doing, but I'm just letting you know if like for some reason you wanted to just do it with a, a loan right off the get-go, we could uh, talk to the seller, let the seller know it'll be a 90-day closing because of the embassy timeline. And, you know, you go under escrow, you'll put up earnest money and we could still extend your closing out 90 to 100 days. So, I wouldn't shift your strategy of being a cash investor versus being a financed investor just because of like a little bit of a logistical uh, 90, 120 day hump in the road, right? Because I mean, the 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 real reason that you should be investing is because you can quadruple your money, right? With the loan, right? Like, I mean, you could, you know, invest in the stock market, right? But you can't get a loan to invest in the stock market. So that's like the true, like best reason that multifamily real estate, especially in the Cleveland market, is going to be uh, better than like stock investing, in my opinion, right? Because you can you can utilize that leverage, right? If you're just going like straight cash, I don't know if there's like that many inherent advantages to buying rental properties uh, versus like other types of investments that are even more passive. That's that's my opinion. That you'd be really missing the mark if we don't finance your investments. Uh, so that's that's how I would handle that logistical issue. So just. And, uh, just Oh, go, go ahead, ahead. sir. Well, I was going to say another thing too, by the way, right? If you're not even worried about the leverage and the principal pay down and all that and being able to quadruple your money, like another reason people choose real estate over other like, you know, simpler investments, again, like stock market investing would be like the appreciation. But in Cleveland specifically, like if you're, it's not like a market where you could buy properties and they're going to be worth like four times as much as they are today in like 20, 30 years, right? If you're going to, be like really aiming for something like that. I mean, you might might as well just buy something in like an expensive coastal market, right? So that's just my thoughts. I think we'd really be missing the curve, uh, really be missing the the heart of why you'd want to do this and why this would set you up in the future if we didn't plan to finance your investments. Yeah, so I appreciate that feedback, right? I, I think that's, you know, I mean, the clarity there um, on, uh, for me, at least more on the, the reasons to, uh, against retirement for, for financing versus paying cash. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, the other, the other question I had for you is, so we currently have, uh, in the States, we have a, we have a house that's mortgaged and we have renters. Um, but that was just a, you know, a resident that I bought a long time ago and then just started renting it out, right? So, um, sure. does that like you used to live there, anyone? right? You used to live there, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, does that help or hurt having that? Like, help or hurt what? Right? I guess that's like help or hurt what? Our ability to get uh, more loans, get another loan. Yeah. Well, um, it. It's, I don't know. We'll 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 find out. Well, first of all, where is? It's in Arizona. Okay. And what'd you pay for it? Three sixty. When did you buy it? Two thousand fourteen. Holy fuck, dude! So that motherfucker's probably worth like seven hundred fifty k right now, right? Yeah, it's worth almost. Well, who knows what? Yes, but ish, like eight hundred plus is what it says. But okay, uh, what are you renting it for? Twenty five hundred. Oh, about 2600. 2600. Okay. So, uh, to answer your question, right? It's not going to be like a simple helps or hurts. Uh, it's it's kind of like with anything, especially real estate, right? There's going to be pros and cons to everything you do, right? Like uh, when I teach people about how to renovate like multifamily properties, right? Like oftentimes, uh, I tell people that they should uh, utilize hardwood flooring as opposed to carpet, because when you have tenants, especially low-income tenants, which we deal with a lot here at Holton Wise, 
uh, you know, their, their pets piss on the floor, they spill things on the floor, they make it a mess. So every time you turn it over, you got to spend a whole bunch of money replacing the carpet. Like basically you're only getting, uh, one, you know, one tenant's worth out of that carpet, then you got to replace it. Right. So the pro of going with the hardwoods is it's going to save you money over the long term. But at the same time, there's a con, of course, which is refinishing the hardwoods will be more expensive in the in the short term. And additionally, uh, it doesn't insulate uh, the unit as well for sound. So sometimes the neighbors fight even more because of sound, right? So it, it's six to one, half dozen to the other, right? There, it's, it's almost like a double-edged sword. Everything is like a double-edged sword, right? So like if I just tell you half the story, you're like, oh, hell yeah, that's great, dude. So uh hardwoods are better than carpet because i don't have to replace them again yes but there's still going to be some negatives it's more expensive up front and of course it sometimes causes issues so with that said everything's going to have like a pro and a con so with your particular property in arizona you're getting 2600 dollars a month in rent and typically uh what like a lender is going to do when they're, they're going over your debt to income ratio and they're figuring out like your debts and in, in how much money you make and how much you can qualify for a mortgage. What they're going to do is they're going to take your uh, expenses on your house, which will be more or less like your principal interest taxes insurance. OK, and then that'll be expenses. So that'll be added to your your overall revolving debt. Right. So revolving debt, credit card debt. Uh, car payments, rent or mortgage uh, over where you're living overseas. I'm assuming it's rent overseas, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. All right. So your rent. So like the, the actual expenses of your rental property in Arizona will be added to that, right? To, for them to factor in your debt to income ratio. However, you get to add in the uh, income, but you don't usually get to add in hundred percent of the income. So for the 2,600, what they'll typically do is they would allow you to do like 75%. Sometimes it's 70. Uh, so for you, it would be like 2,600 times 12. Let's just call it 75%. But again, it might be 70. So they would take all the expenses, like 100% of the revolving expenses that would be added to your debt to income ratio. But they would also add 23,400 if it's 75% towards your income, right? Uh, so depending on like what your expenses are, I don't think it'll probably hurt you too much because you bought it at 360. So you bought it for a fairly low amount, but I don't know if you like did a refi uh, when you got that half a million dollars or so in equity because of the market shift. So did you? No. Okay. So you didn't. So you're sitting on like a huge amount of equity, which is very cool. Uh, so I would say from a debt to income perspective, it probably won't uh, sway it very, very much. Right. Cause I would assume uh, it's probably, more or less covering all of your costs. I don't know uh, the property tax rates out there in Arizona, but I feel like they're lower than they are in Northeast Ohio. So I would say more or less this property is cash flow positive for you, but not very much. Right. Okay. So I would say that's a wash. All right. But it, like I said, it's it's not just only going to be on that level. Like you got to factor in other things. So I would say it's it's kind of like a wash in regards to specifically when you're talking to a lender and, and you're trying to qualify for bigger loans, I would say that's a wash. But even if it was negative, even if it like was hurting you and maybe because of the revolving debt, say this was like cash flow negative by like 200 bucks a month or something, and it would like technically hurt you getting another type of loan, it goes back to like the carpet versus hardwoods. There's good and bad to everything. I would still say overall as part of your investment strategy – uh, the property is going to help regardless of how it would be looked at specifically by a lender in a tunnel just trying to get you approved. Because, like, here's the deal, dude. You bought this thing for $360,000. It's worth, like, eight hundred k, right? And I'm not an expert in Arizona. I have no – I never met you before. I've never talked to you before. And the first thing you told me, I said, when did you buy it? How much did you pay for it? And the first thing I said was, holy fuck, this motherfucker's probably worth like at least seven right now because you, bu matter. you bought it in 2014 when the market was like at the lowest it's ever going to be, like ever, right? And everybody's prices have went up since then, but you bought it in Arizona. Arizona is a net positive population state, right? So without knowing anything about you, where your house is in the entire fucking state of Arizona, I knew 
that your house is going to be worth a fuck ton more than what you bought it, right? So overall, what this should tell you is that the asset that you currently have is a vastly, hugely appreciating asset. And I'm not much of a spec guy. Like I don't try to like convince people to spend money purely on speculation, but I'm telling you this, being a person in the business, in the game, this property that you own in Arizona is going to appreciate more over the next 20 to 25 years than anything you buy in Ohio. So even if it was hurting you from getting these like loans, which again, I think it's a wash, but even if it was, I would still tell you overall for your overall retirement, this property is a huge asset. And I would think it would be a bad decision for you to like sell it to where you could open up some of that debt. Cause again, your debt is so small on it anyway. And plus the thing is actually like a piggy bank. Like you have access to like $400,000 without even having to sell the at the asset if you wanted to, and you could do a big refi. So this property is in my opinion, probably a better property than anything you can buy here in Cleveland. Like as a guy that makes money selling people real estate in Cleveland, I'll tell you this, you do not want to sell that property. And if your main goal is setting you guys up for retirement, this thing's an awesome asset because if we had the same phone call 20 years from now, I bet you that property's worth well over a million dollars. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and um, I, I have to say that again, thank you for that. I, I think it makes, makes me feel a little bit better because that's exactly my thought process as well. I have no intention of selling that property quite yet. I maybe, maybe in 10 years, you know, and hopefully, you know who knows, right? But the the intention was to keep a hold of that. If I were you, um, I wouldn't sell it till I needed a lot of cash for some specific reason, right? Yeah. That, the other thing too, dude, thought, yeah. just so you realize, like, all right, you bought it for three sixty, okay? Let's yep. say you decide to sell it when it's worth a million. By the time it's worth a million, maybe that was in like ten years from now. Maybe, maybe your mortgage is like a hundred k less, right? But you got to understand when you sell that thing for a million, you got to pay all the taxes on the capital gains and everything, right? So you're going to really like walk away with like a lot less money. Uh, and one other thing too, when you look at 30 year loans, this is really important. And I don't feel like people ever really pay attention to this. Well, first of all, interest, what's your interest rate on the loan? I bet it's really low. Yeah, it's 3.75. Okay. So just based on the rate, right? You cannot replace. So you probably owe, because I'm assuming since you you live there, right? It was an owner occupant loan. You probably put down like three percent, maybe ten percent, something low. I, I put zero down. It was a VA loan. Okay, sweet. Uh, oh, VA loan. Thank you for your service. Uh, definitely, thank you for your service. But your loan then is probably over three hundred thousand dollars to this day, right? Ten years later, nine years later. Uh, yeah, it's just above. Yeah. Okay. Not not much. Another seven grand. It goes under. Okay, so you have three hundred seven thousand dollars of debt right now. At three three point seven five percent, okay, it's twenty twenty three. Uh, even if you still lived in Arizona, you cannot replace that three hundred thousand dollars of debt at three point seven five percent. You're going to pay at least double, right? You're going to pay probably seven. And I'm guessing since you are technically living overseas, I'm sure the lenders are going to squeeze you a little harder, and you're probably going to pay just a little smidge more than what somebody who's actually physically on the ground in Arizona would pay, even though you are a U.S. citizen. So you cannot replace that uh, three hundred thousand dollar loan with like like debt. You're going to pay double, right? You're going to get worse debt. So that's one other thing. But another thing that nobody seems to ever think about and pay attention to on these 30-year loans. So just not even thinking about how your interest rate is much lower. Another reason here to really pay attention to is on a 30-year amortization, if you ever actually pull up an amortization schedule, and uh, if you've never looked at one or never looked at an amortization calculator, I have them on holtonwise.com. It's free. It's like the tools section. But if you ever actually look at it, all of your interest is pretty much packed, like jam packed at the beginning of a loan, like loans, 30 year loans, like industry wide on average, typically only last between four and seven years. Like owner occupants typically sell their houses every four to seven years. I think it's, it's like seven is like for owner occupants and then like small rental properties actually trade even faster, but like, let's just call it around seven. Okay. Cause most loans on properties like this are owner occupied, but Lenders have set this the game up, right? Where they know, okay, it's a 30-year loan product, but it's probably only going to last for seven years. 
So if you actually look at your amortization schedule, like all of your interest and stuff, it's like way packed, right? And a hundred, a hundred bucks to principal. <laughs> yeah, but it's less. No, it's like less, right? Like, I mean, if you really look at it, like sometimes, uh, like I know sometimes I, I review them, like obviously the numbers are a little different because a lot of the properties that we're dealing with out here are around the hundred K range. But like you have properties where like the mortgage and stuff is like a thousand. Okay. But in that thousand, it's going to also have your escrow for your insurance. And it's going to have your escrow for your taxes and whatnot, but like literally of a thousand dollar mortgage payment in the first seven years of that, uh, 30 year note, you're literally getting like seven to $9 going towards your principal. Right. So you've already passed that seven year hump. You're at like your nine or 10 now. So now you're really getting into the good stuff, right? So not only is your property going to appreciate like crazy over the next couple, 20, 30 years or whatever, not only is your interest rate for that 300K that you've borrowed, half of what you could borrow a different 300K, you're at the point now where like you're really starting to chunk away at the note. So like that mortgage itself is like a huge asset. So like I forbid you to sell this property and use the money uh, to buy any type of rentals in Cleveland. Like this should be uh, like, this is probably your best asset. And this should be like the foremost asset of your portfolio going forward. Cause like I could sell you a bunch of stuff in Cleveland that I could turn around and sell to anybody else. Okay. What you have is a property with 500 K of equity at a point in your loan where you're paying off principal at a point where your loan is half the cost of a different loan. Like this is something that I could not turn around and sell to another human being, nor could any other broker, right? Like you have something that is no longer able to be purchased in 2023. So like, this is like a really, really good thing. So keep this thing, uh, you know, keep it right. And if you need to free up capital, just do a cash out refi, right? Cause you got, freaking 500k sitting there and then you also don't need to pay capital gains taxes on accessing that 500k so if you ever need cash do a refi but like this should be the last property that you sell yeah absolutely and yeah thank you again yeah I, absolutely i think um our um our intention at least as far as these purchases are concerned um moving forward uh, would we would not be leveraging anything out of the house we you know that's just coming out of our savings um and uh so yeah and and we'll definitely protect that house and, and appreciate that kind of the support there because th this is a discussion that we've both had over time about what do we do with the house and it's always been kind of stick to it stick to the house right so we're going to continue to keep it um and hopefully like you said in in, uh, in a few years it'll be a million bucks and and we'll reevaluate right so Plus, one more thing, too, it kind of ties into what we were talking about earlier, the logistical issues you're going to run into with uh, it being three to four months for you to actually get to an embassy, but me telling you you should still leverage the funds. I mean, you could, if you really wanted to, don't refi this, because again, for all the reasons we just discussed at length, why that mortgage is so good, but you could pull out a home equity line of credit, pull out all that cash that's technically leveraged cash. Now you have the cash that's already 30-year leveraged. And then just use all that cash to make cash purchases so you don't have to do the whole thing with the embassy multiple times, but you still end up with leverage. So you could just do the, the thing once, make the appointment once, but you still get leveraged funds. So this property allows you to do that too. So it, it solves that problem. You don't have to mess with and, the embassy. And, and to Marina's point, I could always just fly back at the States, right? Right, but you don't want to fly back to the States like 10 times, right? You could do it once on a sec on a home equity line of credit, and then boom, you don't have to mess with it. And then you got all the cash to play with, but it's not like actual cash, right? It was, it was still leveraged cash. Yeah, no, what uh, Marina was just saying was I fly there for business anyway. So oh, if well, I there got, you go. Right, you know, I mean, yeah, it's not just there for it. Yeah, and you don't have to obviously be in Ohio. So whatever state that you fly to, as long as you're in the U.S., boom, like we'll have no to reason meet you, like wherever that yeah. is. Yeah, well, I fly to D.C. quite a bit, so um, so if I got to go into D.C., I, I can go anywhere from there, right? And so it doesn't that I didn't think of that, right? I was I was just like, because she was saying, why is that a problem? We could just fly there and do it, and I and I didn't think to leverage the fact that when I do go for business, I can always add a couple of things, right? Right. Okay, so one big question now: uh, How can we move? Forward, being out of state investors 
what is the best way for us, what is the best area for us, what is the best strategy for us that you would advise? Well, uh, that's a good question. And I guess we will uh, spend the rest of the convo trying to answer that, right? So I was reviewing the notes uh, where you guys kind of told me just like a background of like what you're interested in. And one of the things that you guys talked about, which I think we should probably knock this discussion out because I think it will kind of open up like the rest of like how to answer that question is my understanding is uh, you, Marina, are, are into Section 8 and you, Mark, are not into Section 8, okay? So I, I think this is a good convo to have. And then from there, I feel like it'll kind of open us up to what I think would be the best thing for you guys. Now, uh, you guys probably both watched the Tennis from Hell show that we do here, right? I did, yes. I don't know. I think Marina, she's watched all of your stuff. I She okay. just brought me. I, I watched you since, what, uh, four years even before COVID when that's when I started watching you. Okay, so Tennis from Hell, right? That's like, you know, that's the rough stuff, right? And we think it's very important to show you guys that. Now, uh, I think like a lot of, this is like the biggest misconception, I think, in regards to real estate, okay? People are like, People have this this like misconception that like Section Eight tenants are inherently more risky and dangerous than not like re like cash paying tenants. Okay, and that, believe it or not, is actually completely untrue. You see, oh, yeah. what what we have here is you have to look at the asset. Okay, if you like. The for instance, your Arizona house that is worth 800k, okay, that asset is going to attract a tenant base. There's a certain tenant base that can afford to live in your $800,000 Arizona property. In your $800,000 Arizona property, you would be batshit fucking crazy to allow a Section 8 tenant to move into that property because that is like an A class asset and that A class asset can attract tenants who could afford A class properties, right? So you're gonna get people uh, with really good incomes, college degrees, things of that nature, right? Thinking about it, like what I just said in a tunnel, people then take that notion and they're like, okay, so section eight tenants are worse than regular tenants. Not the case. It's it's really the neighborhood that determines your tenant base. So in an A-grade neighborhood, you're going to get A-grade tenants, so you would never mess with Section 8 tenants. But if you then try to apply that same concept to, to like C-grade multifamily assets in Cleveland or D-grade multifamily assets, the things that most people like to buy from Holton Wise that like watch Holton Wise TV, you guys see these properties. It's like 100K property. Two tenants both pay like eight fifty, right? Well, that is like a C grade or a D grade asset. You are never, ever in any circumstance. I mean, you could you could get gold toilets if you wanted. You're still never going to get an A grade tenant, uh, somebody who would like consider living in your eight hundred k Arizona house. They would never ever move to a C grade neighborhood living in like a C grade duplex. So you'll never get the A grade tenants, right? So what that leaves you is tenants who are willing to live in like C and D grade neighborhoods. When you're in C and D grade neighborhoods, all the tenants, every one of them, every one of the tenant, whether they have Section 8 or Eden or cash or this or that, all of the tenants who are willing to live in that neighborhood are going to be inherently as a group much more risky than tenants who are able and willing to live in an A-grade neighborhood. So when we look at it in just from that neighborhood perspective, everybody's going to be higher risk. Of the higher risk tenants, the Section 8 tenants in this scenario are actually lower risk because when you're dealing with tenants in such a high risk pool, the biggest problem is people who are not able to make rent. And then when you can't make rent, that sends an owner down the spiral, uh, which is how you end up on the tenants from hell show. Because in these lower income neighborhoods, neighborhoods where there's a prevalence of Section 8 tenants, 
These are also neighborhoods where there's a prevalence of crime. The crime, of course, is going to be much higher in like a C, D neighborhood versus an A grade neighborhood with like a ton of owner occupants and, and, and where everybody, you know, they, you know, they just, they make a lot of money. They have 750 plus credit scores, right? When you're in these Cleveland areas like this, that's not the case. And you're going to see more crime. So like when you have a unit uh, that, that has a tenant who doesn't pay rent, like it just sets off a bunch of other problems for you, right? So like first problem, tenant doesn't pay rent. You lose rent for about three months. You spend the money to evict the tenant. Then the unit's vacant. Sometimes why units are vacant, uh, which is why I actually like multifamily in these neighborhoods better than single family, because when it's a multifamily, even when you evict one tenant, the, the building itself is never really truly vacant. Most likely you already have the other tenant because the single family vacant houses in these neighborhoods are a target, right? You get people that will break in, Sometimes they'll steal appliances. What's very common here in the Cleveland market is they will steal copper plumbing because you can cut out the copper plumbing and take it to the scrapyard, get paid, and then you you know do drugs with it or whatever. Uh, so I think multifamily keeps you safer because you always have someone living there. Uh, but it just takes you down the spiral, right? Section eight eliminates all that, right? Because if the tenants themselves that are already high risk people don't run into the risk of losing their job or having the decision to spend your rent money on something else like a, a birthday party or, or or clothes or whatever they want. Uh, you eliminate that risk, which then eliminates the loss of rent, the court costs, the house being vacant, being a target for other theft. So it really eliminates it. So the true question is not, should we go Section 8 or should we not go Section 8, Okay. The true question is, should we go in a low-income neighborhood or should we not go in a low-income neighborhood? Because if you're going to go in a low-income neighborhood, Section 8 doesn't increase your risk when you're already in the low-income neighborhood. Section 8 is going to decrease your risk when you're in the low-income neighborhood. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Okay. That's that what I was trying to explain to him for uh, yeah. for. Sometimes yeah. they're, they're exactly the same thing, especially that uh, sec as, as I know, the Section 8 can lose if they misbehave or I don't know. I read it somewhere. They can lose the right for the uh, for the property from the government, right? They, <laughs> they lose this voucher right, something like that. Uh, well, I mean, that's there. I think theoretical that's supposed to be possible, but I haven't seen it uh, happen. Um, <sighs> Section 8 is you're, you're you're working with the u.s government okay you not being a u.s citizen i don't know how familiar you are with dealing with the government but uh the u.s government at least i'm sure mark can tell you having dealt with like things like i don't know going to the post office his entire life <laughs> anytime you're dealing with uh the government it, the u.s government it's it's very unorganized there's a lot of bureaucracy and there's a lot of nonsense uh, and, I i'm from russia don't scare me with anything else <laughs> Well, I just I, I, I just want you to know what you're getting into, because what you have to understand is with Section 8. Uh, well, first of all, Section 8 is like the name, OK, of like where government like the entities, the government pays the people's rent. But like every little area geographically in the USA is going to have what's called a housing authority. Right. So two housing authorities that Holton Wise deals with the most are uh, CMHA and LMHA. Okay, CMHA stands for Cuyahoga County Metropolitan Housing Authority. LMHA is Lorraine County How Metropolitan Housing Authority, right? And the reason we work with these the most is because Cleveland's a city, which is located in the county of Cuyahoga County. And then we deal we do a lot of properties in like a city called Lorraine, a city called Elyria, which if you've been watching my stuff for four years, you probably see a lot of those. So that's Lorraine. So when I discuss section eight know that like uh 99 of my dealings with section eight are, are are in dealing with the two housing authorities that operate the section eight program in my geographic location now i will tell you in dealing with all of these housing authorities that if you have a scenario or you have a question for a housing authority employee uh, you could ask that employee that question, and then you could ask four other employees that question. So five employees, you're going to get five answers. And then you could ask that same question to those same five people six months from now, and you're going to get five totally separate answers. Uh, so it's it's very unorganized, okay? Uh, so in theory, they, they say that uh, if tenants do misbehave and they do abuse the system, that they will pull their, their, their vouchers. I have yet to see... Uh, 
a housing authority pull a tenant's voucher. And I will tell you that like when Section 8 tenants do move out of your homes, uh, they're very rough and you're going to see uh, a lot of money that you have to pay to, to re-renovate them. But I will tell you this, that's what you're signing up for if you're buying like a lower income asset. The tenants that move out uh, in the condition that they leave their their duplex, like these hundred thousand dollar duplexes, which again is like what ninety five percent of the audience of like my content is looking for. Uh, when you have a hundred thousand dollar duplex in the Cleveland market and a tenant moves out of it, the Section Eight tenants do not leave it more inherently damaged than non Section Eight tenants. There is, I do not find them to be a higher risk, uh, but the damages that they do cause are usually going to exceed the security deposit. And uh, I've never seen a situation, nor do I think it's a plausible scenario where you'd be able to get that tenant, uh, you'd be able to leverage that to get that tenant to pay all those damages. It's usually just gonna yeah. be a sunk cost for you, the landlord. And these are so, people that are, one more thing, sorry to cut you off, Mark, but I just wanna get this out why it's on top of my head. These are people that are more or less judgment proof. You've heard the term, I uh, can't get water from a rock. Like the, right. these are these are going to be judgment proof people. So you guys, you do have to understand that uh, when you go into this, like because like you could pay me to to sue a tenant for like four grand for you all day, uh, and we'll win all day. We'll get a judgment for you all day, but collecting that judgment, you're kind of up up a creek without a paddle because like right. they don't have a house that you could lean. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. No. I and and I absolutely understand that. And um. So I was going to ask two things from that. Uh, the first thing is, is that so typically do you look for Section 8 housing that is completely covered by the Section 8 voucher? In other words, the, the rent, I mean. Um, and, the, and then this, if, that, that, if that's even possible, right? I don't, I don't know if it is. It, uh, okay, so I laugh because it goes to my other question of like, how convoluted it is working with the freaking U.S. government. Uh, it's so it's so weird the way they do it. Like the process, um, the process of getting like Section Eight to tell you how much your unit is going to get it, it is like it's wildly ridiculous. Like they have like a chart on their website which tells you like what the fair market value of the units will be. Okay. And then they they list the number, but in actual practice, that's never the number. It's almost like I don't know. They're like picking it out of a freaking hat. Uh, so when I do my videos where I estimate the market rent for you guys, I give you an estimate of what it like typically is gonna end up being, uh, just based on my knowledge. But it like we've had literally like identical units, right? Like identical units like get. Uh, a different valuation from Section 8. Um, and that's just kind of something that happens. So their process of how they determine how much the tenant has to pay, uh, they we have to fill out like RAFTAs and all these forms and whatnot. And like they go through like a very long convoluted process and then they kind of determine that. You don't always know uh, immediately when working with that tenant how uh, much that's gonna be. It's, it's, it's a very difficult to explain process. Like we have like a whole fact on holtonwise.com that tries to touch on this. Uh, so I guess in an effort to avoid just kind of rambling for the next like 45 minutes, I will tell you this. What we like to do is essentially set you up with a tenant uh, who's got like in the range of like 70% paid by Section 8. Uh, typically the tenants that have 100% of their rent paid, uh, it, it's few and far between where they get the full hundred. But when you get the people that they pay a very, 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 very small amount, sometimes those, those folks, they're a little difficult to get into the units too. Cause like, they're never used to like having any responsibility over their finances. So they won't even have like security deposits. And even for section eight tenants, we still make them come up with the security deposit. So we find more or less in general, you get the folks around the 70%, 80% range. That, that seems to be kind of the best sweet spot. If if that okay. hopefully answers your question, no, that does. Section, um, I I just I cannot like my honest like full blown opinion. By the way, too, I'm like it may seem to you that I'm like telling you that Section Eight you should not go with Section Eight. That's not what I'm telling you at all. 
if you're going to go in the C grade uh, neighborhoods, these 100K duplexes, I think Section 8 is the way to go. But I just want to make sure that you are prepared to understand uh, that, like, the actual process is going to be a little bumpy. And, and, and oftentimes you're going to get answers from us that are like, well, that doesn't even make sense. Why is it doing it that way? That, like, that's non-logical. But that's just how it is. I, I don't I don't know what to tell you. That's just like how it's going to be when you work with Section 8. Uh, it's a confusing process and they have like a very heavy turnover, right? So like, you know, you'd be yeah. starting the process and then like that employee gets fired or quits and they're turning people over. The whole thing's kind of like a chaotic mess. Uh, but at the end of the day, once you actually get those tenants into your units, your rent is paid consistently every single month. And that is the biggest problem when we get into these areas, right? So like the process of getting a tenant uh, from applying to your unit to actually physically moving into your property with Section 8. It's like a 90-day process, uh, but it's worth it at the end because these are also people that don't move every year. They kind of like set it and forget it, and that's how you end up with like long-term tenants. Like it, it, You shouldn't buy a Cleveland duplex expecting your tenant's going to live there for eight years, uh, but if you have section eight tenants, you're much more likely to get that super long-term tenancy than like cash bank tenants. A lot of the cash bank tenants like will literally move in and out of these duplexes like every year or two. And all the, the constant turnovers will just, you just eat up your profits with that. So like section eight is absolutely the way to go. If you're going to be in this asset class, I just want to make sure you guys are aware. Uh, this kind of going to be a pain in the butt. Holton Wise will handle all this. We actually charge you for it too. We don't just do it out of the kindness of our heart. We charge an additional thousand dollars to every owner to place a Section Eight tenant, so we can navigate uh, this whole process of going back and forth with the paperwork with the housing authority. But at the end of the day, once you get through all that, uh, you are in a much better position to consistently earn revenue from these lower income houses if you go the Section Eight route. From there, the only uh, cost you're ever really going to have is every single year they will come in and they do an inspection and very rarely do they ever come out of the inspection without hitting you for something. Uh, so you might be spending like a grand or two grand every single year because uh, Section A will just come in and they'll be like, this door handle's loose or this wall, they want you to repaint a wall, like stuff like that. It's so like if your tenant like has like a couch and they bash the couch into the into the wall and there's like a scuff or like a hole nothing happens until like the next year and then section eight might come in there and they might tell us we got a you know spackle and then paint that entire wall like little ticky tack things like that uh but those things are, are are very small compared to the costs you're gonna deal with if you're doing full unit turns and having vacant units so a little bit of hassle kind of some annoying stuff there's some very frustrating moments but i do think it's absolutely the way to go uh i love it for, well, that if, that if, if we TV. decide to go to that area. But my question was, in our situation, being out of state investors, which area do you advise us to? Do you recommend to go to this area, or would you recommend to stay away in the beginning from this those areas? Well, uh, I guess that's really a question for you, right? Um, because. With what we do here in the Cleveland market and, and what investors come to us looking for, um, most of the time, unless you're interested in this, like these like cash flow neighborhoods or the C grade stuff, uh, unless that's like what you want, there isn't often really that like big of a reason to be in the Cleveland market, I would say, because like, that's what most people come here for. Cause like, yes, we have like a grade neighborhoods, obviously. Yes. We have like higher grade neighborhoods, but like where the market is right now, like uh, you could take like a, a suburb that is close to Cleveland. It's Parma. Okay. Uh, right now, like with a Cleveland duplex. Okay. You could buy a Cleveland duplex for like around a hundred K and you'll probably get, about 850 a unit, right? So about 1700 a month total rent for that duplex. But you're very much going to be in this whole like lower income thing where I tell you typically your Section 8 tenants are going to be better for you than cash bank tenants. If you want to like move up in a neighborhood grade 
you could go like up to like a B grade neighborhood, which would be like the, the first one I'm thinking of is like a neighborhood called Parma, where the majority of the housing in that city is driven by owner occupants and stuff. Uh, and you could buy like a, a, a nice 1950s build brick duplex. But right now where the market is, you're going to pay about 200,000 for that. Uh, but your rents aren't going to double. Uh, your 850 rent is is probably 950. Okay. So for the extra 100K. So there's no point, basically. Absolutely no yeah, point. Yeah. So like I, I deal with a lot of like out-of-state investors. Like you guys are obviously a little different because like you don't have any hometown in the USA that you currently live in right now. Uh right. To invest in down your street right you obviously can't do that from from where you're at but like if, if you're interested in like a lot of people like will get that live in expensive areas and they just want to come to cleveland uh because of the like the low cost and the high cash flow stuff uh but then if they determine like oh i don't want to be in the super like the kind of risky low income stuff oftentimes my advice to them is well okay well just why don't you just invest in the city you live in then because like once you get past like cleveland and these like cash flow section eight neighborhoods like we don't really have like super attractive price to rent ratios that that make uh, this market, in my opinion, any any more advantageous for a person than investing at home. Because at that point, cash flow is kind of a wash, and what you should really be focusing on is principal pay down of the loan and then appreciation, right? But like, you know, twenty years from now, we're looking at three markets for say, let's say Cleveland, Ohio, any anywhere in Florida, anywhere in Arizona. Well, 20 years from now, where's like who's going to have a lower population than today and who's going to have a higher population? Anywhere in Florida, the population will be higher in 20 years. Anywhere in Arizona, the population will be higher in 20 years. Ohio, uh, net population loss. Uh, the loss has slowed down quite a bit, but in 20 years, there's probably going to be less people living in Ohio than live there today. And those people go places like Florida, Arizona. So if you're moving out of the cash flow and into super low risk stuff, and you're not really thinking about like, let's get that cash flow, let's set ourselves up for 20, 30 years down the road. I think appreciation safety is what's going to be important. And I would spend that money in warm weather Southern states. Yeah. So, so a lot of what you just said, gold dust, right? Um, I, I appreciate that. I think so moving forward, we're, I, I think you've answered the question for me at least from the from the section eight side and and I'm mad enough to admit, you know, I was wrong. Um so as usual. As usual. <laughs> <laughs> so um <laughs> so uh the, the next I guess the next question is, and I know that we're running low on time. So um I guess the next question for for is really what do we what's the next step really what's the next step? what should what should be our strategy because we would like to move on uh with with something and how can you help us with that <clears throat> okay well i've explained to you how section 8 investing is going to look uh kind of just touched on the numbers of it and uh touched on my thoughts on like section eight lower income investing in cleveland versus uh staying with like above that in a neighborhood grade that is higher if after you guys just listen to me give you like you know the like just like a super honest like yo this is like what your experience is going to be like if you're like yeah fuck yeah that sounds like what we want to do like we're down to deal with that we're down uh, to understand that like it's going to be frustrating, but that's what we want to do. That's great. That's easy. Uh, from there, it's really just on me. And uh, we have two videos for you right now already like uh, in your account bank, so to speak, right? And what I will do is I will go out and I will find the best uh, property that I think meets your needs. And it's going to be in that Section 8 space, right? So we're going to be looking at properties that are generally going to be in like around the 100k range right you know sometimes maybe 90 but need some repairs maybe like 120 somewhere in that general range and we're going to be looking at stuff that's going to be in what i would consider a c grade or a d grade neighborhood uh where i would say you can go cash or section 8 tenants but section 8 would be preferred and uh i'll make you videos when a, a property that i think will work for you uh comes up and then I send you the video privately. So you get like a private link. It gets uploaded to the Holton Wise TV YouTube channel, but it's like a private link. I send it to you and I, I'm just talking. I mean, you've seen the MLS search analysis shows. I, I know you have, right, Marina? Yeah. So, so all the, yeah. So all the MLS search analysis shows that you guys have seen 
uh, those are like when they get released on Holton Wise TV, those are about a year old. OK, so a year before you see them, they were sent to that person that I was talking to privately. And uh, I'll, I'll run over the property. I'll try to give you as open and honest analysis of the property that I possibly can. So you, you know what you're in for. Uh, I'll break down how much it's going to rent for what we got to do to get it running optimally because typically they're not going to be running optimally, right? They're just, it's, you know, it's just what the per the current person's doing. So like, if they're doing stuff good, I'll tell you what they're doing good. If they're doing stuff bad, I'll tell you what they're doing bad. And I'll tell you what we want to do. And then I send that to you and you guys discuss it amongst yourself. And if you want to then move forward to buy that property, we would then make an offer on that property. I would be your, your broker and I would negotiate the deal with the seller and the listing agent. And then after the deal closes, we'll onboard you into our management system, and then we'll handle all your property management. So the process itself uh, is going to be seamless, simple, and easy. And uh, it sounds like you want to continue to move forward with like this Section 8 type investing. So that's that's what we would do. I just wanted to make yeah. sure that you knew going into it what that would look like. Because every one of those tenants from hell videos, you know, like every one of I was I was more worried because in some videos I remember you were like saying this is not for the newbies, this is not for the you know new investors, certain properties. That's why it made me a little bit confused uh, about that. Well, that's a great question. So um in our ten like thus far, what I've illustrated for you is essentially what your expectations should be should you buy properties in like a c ish d ish grade neighborhood we actually believe it or not have neighborhoods that are even worse than that like considerably worse than that uh i i put this out it's on the tools and resource section of holtonwise.com okay it's called the ultimate guide to grading cleveland neighborhoods uh you just click yeah, that right. okay so like i've illustrated for you what C and D grade investing, like what your ownership experience will look and feel like. You could actually buy properties uh, where you can get that similar eight fifty a month rent roll per unit. Okay, like I've been just loosely discussing being able to buy like a hundred k duplex where each tenant pays eight fifty, and they're most likely a Section Eight tenant. You could even actually in the Cleveland market pick up a property for like 50 or 60 K with a similar rent roll, but then you'll be in like an F grade neighborhood. Uh, and the ownership experience is going to be like dramatically more dangerous and worse. And then oftentimes you can't even actually hire legitimate property managers to, to manage those assets for you. Like we don't actively manage those assets uh, because I, I just, my turnover is too high. Like I can't get my contractors to go to those neighborhoods because they're afraid of their trucks getting breaking into being accosted. Like the crime rates, like literally through the freaking roof. Uh, so like leasing agents, things like that. Like for me as a business owner, like I just can't staff my company, uh, effectively, uh, and get quality employees that were willing to work in neighborhoods that dangerous. So, um, it gets even more difficult. That's like F grade stuff. I haven't been talking to you guys about that. When you see our tenants from hell videos, that content uh, comes from a combination of sources, right? So that content is, you're going to see a lot of stuff uh, that is managed by our portfolio, like where we are managing it. And like, those are our tenants, but you're also going to see uh, a lot of stuff where uh, people come to us with major problems, okay? And like all of our live eviction videos and like a lot of the eviction content, like uh, the majority of the tenants that Holton Wise actually evicts are not tenants that Holton Wise ever actually placed in a property. Probably like 80 to 90% of the tenants we evict uh, are, are tenants where they were placed by like a landlord and then that landlord got in over their head and then they come to us and they're like, yo, Here's my property. Uh, this tenant's not paying rent. Can you guys take it over? And then, then we go in and we take it over and we evict them, right? So uh, every single like piece of Tennis from Hell content that you do see, at some point at the beginning, if you rewind like six months, two years, three years before it became like a piece of Tennis from Hell content, there was somebody who's like, yeah, I'm going to make money on this investment. And then it just wore them out and they eventually got to that point. I just wanted to illustrate for you uh, like what it could all look like. Um, but if we go into like the C-ish grade stuff, I don't think you're going to be like evicting people constantly. And especially if you do Section 8, you won't. But I just, again, I wanted to illustrate for you 
what that would look like. And I would stick to the C and D type assets uh, because I typically don't take on clients like this that uh, like when you say newbies, okay, like as a newbie, um, I won't usually position you into a, an F class neighborhood. Cause like I myself will not be able to be there as your property manager going forward. So when you see the investment properties for sale show, if you actually uh, look up the address on the property, cause it's obviously in every show and you correlate that with the ultimate guide to grading Cleveland neighborhoods, I would say the majority of the time that I'm telling you it's not for newbies, it's because it doesn't fall into at least a D level neighborhood or higher. Uh, so that would be like a lot of F grade neighborhoods. And, uh, yeah, and I've been doing that. I, I've been leveraging that tool um, yeah. because like I've been looking at a lot of properties. And so then I go to, then I go to your tools there, that guide, and I look up by the, by the zip code. Yeah. And it tells so, me where that falls in, right? So, so when I say hard. like no newbies, even though I just explained to you like C and D is still going to be rough, going to be difficult. We're going to have problems. And like some of that content does end up on tennis from hell. It's, it's, there's like another level of danger, which we haven't discussed. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend that for you because that would be that would just be crazy, right? You guys are like overseas. I just be like, yeah, you could buy this and then like you're on your own and then you have to hire somebody else. That's just too much, right? Like that kind of stuff is it, it's usually the people that do the best are people that like have been in the business and they have like their own property management company where like the people are their own employees or like their local people and their contractors. Like if like if you guys watch our a lot of our eviction videos, um, like every city has different um, rules and laws and how evictions uh, happen. And like in specifically Cleveland, uh, there, th when like Holton Wise does an eviction, um, actual employees of Holton Wise are not physically allowed to touch any of the tenant's stuff. You have to subcontract that job out uh, to a third party company who's approved by the court. They give you like a list. It's like 10 different companies and uh, Holton Wise, the actual employees that I pay like hourly, you know, they change the locks and do all that jazz, but like the people that physically remove the tenant's belongings, um, they're technically employed by like a, a subcontractor uh, who's a Cleveland approved eviction company, right? And the reason I'm rambling telling you this is because the guy that owns that company, I've been hiring him for over 10 years now, he uh, actually is a landlord himself and he owns like 50 something houses uh, in what I would say are the F grade neighborhoods in Cleveland, but that guy is a local. He's got a whole friggin' crew of hourly people that he works with day in, day out. He's physically in these neighborhoods removing. I mean, he, he evicts, he evicts 20 people a day, right? So he's like the kind of guy that like could come in and, and he could navigate those extremely high risk situations. Cause his cost to do everything is obviously, you know, immaculately lower than somebody out of state. So like that guy, right? He, he would be an example of somebody who should buy a $40,000 duplex that rents for 1700. You guys right. would not be, in my opinion, the candidate for that. Nor, nor, nor does it sound like we want to be. Um, yeah, no, he's, so. he's savage. He's, he's savage, brutal. He's, he's an right. animal. I'm a licensed broker, so I can't do some of the things he can do. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't... Um, <laughs> I get you. I, I think so. So it's good. The last part, and sorry, I'm, I seem a bit rushed now because I know that we're we're out of time. But um, but what I wanted what I wanted to find out was, so you answered the the question on the two. Um, you, you'll go around and you pull some properties for us, and that's fantastic. I, I can't wait for that. Um, the second thing is, uh, as far as from a timing perspective. So I put in my, my little answer back to you uh, about stack method, right? And so this is something I've heard, I, you know, it wasn't trying to sound like I'm like, I know what I'm talking about. It was just sure. a term I was told about um, and that it was, you know, so your first deal one, your next deal two or a duplex, your next deal and so on. I don't really care about uh, really the, the progression as much as I care about the timing, right? So and I know it's kind of the reverse for a lot of people. It's less about the timing and more about the deal. But I think what we're looking to, or what at least what I'm looking to understand is, it's fine if we get our feet wet, you know, but I don't want to bite off more than I can chew either. So, so for example, if, if we want to buy two now, is there a problem with buying two now and then moving on 
or should we just stick to one and see what it's like and then decide from there? I would say six to one, half dozen the other. Doesn't really matter. Um, I don't. It's up to you. Like, uh, I provide you the videos as properties that I think are gonna make sense for you become available, right? So like one week, right? Like you might get three videos from me, but then like you don't get a video for a couple of weeks and then you get a couple more, right? So it's it's kind of like as the deals come and then I send them to you. And then from there, it, it's really gonna be up to you uh, how quick or how slow you wanna move. Like uh, from our perspective, like we're not gonna be like, you gotta move fast or you gotta move slower. It's, it's irrelevant to us. You go at your own speed. I don't really believe that um, there's gonna be any measurable difference in your overall outcome if you bought one and then waited three months and bought another one versus buying two right away. It's, it, it, I don't think it will matter. Uh, I would just focus it. on making sure you like the deal and it's a good deal and you think it's a good deal versus like we have to get two in this year and then we have to get another two. Like I would use that as like kind of like a rough guideline of your overall business, but I, I don't think it's, it's, it's feasibly gonna matter. I think what really matters is if you look at this from a long-term perspective, uh, as a US citizen, I think the biggest thing for you is you can get 10 residential mortgages that sell on the secondary market to Fannie and Freddie. You've already exhausted one of those, which we have already established is a huge, a huge win for you, your house in Arizona. I don't know if you ever plan on coming back to the States. Let's just assume you do. So I would keep one more available to you. So that's two mortgages, right? So from then you have eight mortgages. Now I know we discussed potentially doing like a home equity line of credit, uh, to use that cash to just buy all these properties in Cleveland cash. But like eventually at some point, I would assume you'd want their own mortgage to be on them. So I think for you, the biggest thing you should focus on is I get 10 30 year mortgages, which is in my opinion, the best, most important number one reason to invest in real estate, 25% down bank kicks in 75%. You get 30 years to pay the sucker off, but you can only get 10 of those because only 10 will sell on the secondary market, okay? Right. One for Arizona, one for the personal house. That leaves you with eight. Before like thinking or focusing on, should we do one this month or one that month? I think your overall plan should be like, we should buy eight assets for eight mortgage slots. That that's That's what I think the most important thing is. And for a lot of people, there's really no reason to, to even go beyond that, really. Like, uh, I mean, shit. If you take eight, eight properties, 25K a piece, that, that would be 200K out of your pocket uh, to own close to a million dollars worth of real estate. I mean, for a lot of people, like that's where they want to, they stick, right? Not a lot of investors end up going over more than that. Because once you get over that, by the way, you can no longer get those 30 year loans. And then like what you want to do in the business is going to drastically change. So for, for me, that's, that's what I'd be looking at. I'd be looking at eight mortgages. Uh, so that, that was very helpful. Uh, that's exactly why we had this session with you, by the way, because the stuff that you're saying, while very just, of course, to you is not necessarily of course to me. And well, I have to admit, my wife has already said a lot of this, you know, along the same lines of thinking, right? So, sure. but that's because uh, she's good at this kind of stuff. I just want to make sure that, um, you know, that we're, that we're in line, you know, so I have lots of good ideas. It doesn't mean it's a good idea to do it, right? And so, so I think in this, in this, uh, what we've discussed today makes me feel a lot better about the situation. I think we definitely want to move forward, right? There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, and I mean, I want to do it sooner than later. I just don't want to be that that idiot that just dives into things because you know he thinks it's going to make him some kind of millionaire at some point, right? I want to I want to be calculated about our approach. I want to understand the approach, and I want to be able to execute on the approach, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so that's kind of a. I, I come from you know as you know military background. I was a police officer for a number of years, and now I'm I do you know uh, other operational work, um, and and so. Yeah, I kind of order. I kind of put in an order to things, right? In order for it to make sense, so. Um, but this, this just, this is fantastic. That's, that's what I, I think. Yeah. You you know, think? One thing I want to add too, and you know, by design, when I talk to folks, like I, I try not to, to, to sound fluffy 
and uh, try not to be like, oh, everything's going to be so great. Everything's so great. I mean, you can get that anywhere you want. Somebody trying to sell you, uh, you know, a dream. I, I try to really just like open your mind to like a lot of the cons because like it is a very tough business. And like a lot of people just like they don't like to deal with it. Right. And like a lot of the things that happen, it like it, it really rubs people the wrong way. Like when people steal from you or destroy your house or or things of this nature, a lot of people. Uh, just don't have the appetite for real estate. So like when I talk to people, I really like to just like lead with that kind of stuff and discuss it with you. So you know what we're getting into. Um, Cause like whenever you're dealing with this kind of stuff, it's the tenants are not like your friends, like they're kind of working against you. Um, I mean, honestly, sometimes it, it probably would feel like being the warden of the prison uh, more than like being like the concierge at a hotel. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. So I just like to make sure you guys understand that uh, before we move forward. But at the end of the day, it's actually like, yeah, there's going to be hundred percent guarantee that eventually bad shit will happen to you guys. Like when you own these properties, but like your actual like risk of like a major loss is, is pretty much like null. I mean, uh, Again, sorry, but don't you usually put some amount uh, for the maintenance and uh, you know, insurance for, for this kind of things when you calculate everything, right? Yeah. I put those estimates uh, I put those estimates in all my videos. You'll see those estimates. Um, so I don't keep that money. I send it back to you. Okay. So it's up to you guys to maintain, uh, some money because like repairs and things like that will happen. But what I, what I just do want to stress, like I've been talking like a little gloomy. I just want you guys to understand, like if you buy a hundred thousand dollar house, I mean more, I know we have logistical issues with the mortgages, but more or less the way it's going to pan out. You're going to pay 25k for this $100,000 house out of your pocket. You're going to exhaust 25k. The bank's going to kick in 75k and they're going to appraise the asset. You can't overpay for it. The the bank's putting in more money than you guys are. The bank ain't going to let you lose their money. So, you buy a property, you're only spending 25k and like if you ran the property for like a year and then you're like, "Holy crap, I hate being a landlord actually. I tried it, but I realized it's terrible for me." Like Okay, you sell the property and you get 100k back. Like it's, you know what I'm saying? So like I I don't want you guys to think like this is crazy super risky thing we're going to do. Where people run into crazy super risk though, right? Would be like if you're some like I see scams like this all the time. Like they would take people like you. You're like, "Oh yeah, we want to pay cash." And there's people that will prey on that. And they're like, "Oh yeah, you want to pay cash? That's great." They'll sell you a property in an F grade neighborhood where they normally sell for 50, but they'll just sell it to you for 100 and then you just look at the rent roll and you're like, "Oh, 1800 in rent." 100k you buy it cash there's no appraisal so you don't really know you're not familiar with cleveland you haven't been to cleveland and you don't realize that on this side of town it's worth 100 but on this side of town it's only worth 50 and then you lose your 50k so like when you guys hear those like extreme horror stories of people like losing their ass like that right there that's how that would happen that's exactly why we we contacted you yeah so because we had this kind of offers and i said you know oh yeah you know what you actually sent me one by the way uh one one four oh one uh methyl four four one two oh yeah it was a, yes. you sent me that it was the, the blue house like that's one it was it was like well done and like it was like a 10 page offering memorandum and everything looked cool uh but the house was like 65k like that's like a you don't need to pay 65k for a single family house in that neighborhood like i i wouldn't buy that house I, it's just overpriced like the renovation was fine but like if you're just if you're just looking at like that's a situation where it looks like the seller is really trying to really focus on buyers who would be buying it cash just based on the the rent to price ratio but at the end of the day and that's why i think i i really push financing on people especially people that are out of state like it 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 really covers your butt uh because the bank is not going to do that the bank does not give a fuck what the rent is or what the rent could be when the bank does an appraisal on a residential house one unit two unit three unit four unit okay uh they are only going to go off of comparable sales okay so you you can't you really can't. i mean i guess you could but it's like really hard to dramatically overpay and lose a ton of money investing out of state if you're getting a loan on the property whereas even like all the stuff if like every horrible section eight scenario happened to you guys that i just explained on a hundred thousand dollar house you bought but that house was worth a hundred and you paid a hundred you're still going to be doing way better than if you bought the one on methyl for 65 and it's really only worth 45. 
Like right there, you just burn 20 K. You know what I'm yeah, saying? So that, yeah. And interesting on that one as well. Right. So I, I get the lipstick on a pig kind of thing. They did a lot on the inside, right. To get it up there. But I looked, I looked backwards, you know, I went and looked through the property records on that. And the last time it was purchased for eight grand. Right. And then I started to look at the rest of the neighborhood. The rest of the neighborhood was eight grand, 15 grand. There's a bunch of, uh, well, there's not a bunch, but there's empty lots down the street. And I know that's one thing that you said to look out for um, on one of your videos a while ago, but, but it was like all this whole area, everything was, was bought up at, at 8,000. And now this, everybody's trying to sell them for 50 to 70. Right. So yeah. like that would that, be a high, that's an incredibly high risk investment. And like, I told you the story about the guy that does my evictions, like, he would buy properties in that neighborhood and he would do well, but he wouldn't buy them from some guy for 65 K he'd be the guy coming in, buying them lower and renovating himself. Yeah. So like that would be like a very poor investment for you guys. That would be an investment because you'd have to buy it cash. Cause, and I, I, I would assume the seller probably is telling you to pay cash because you could, it wouldn't appraise. So like that would be a very poor investment. I wouldn't do that one. Uh, and, the crazy thing too is obviously like all the, the tenant risks that I had just been talking to you guys about for an hour, you're still going to have those very same risks, if not more of those, you were going to actually have more of them there. So you have that on top of like the loss. So uh, your risks are really uh, like a major, major catastrophe. They're, they're, they're actually pretty minimal. It's just going to be like what the tenant can do. Uh, and you know, it sucks sometimes, uh, but like, that that's all simple, easy uh, to knock out. So, yeah, my advice is, if you're down for the the hard life, because it's a little hard and it's rocky at first, and it sounds like you guys are totally down for that. And like, it's it's yeah. not that big a deal. Like, you get used to it. But just, you know, every I deal with people. Like, we have like hundreds of thousands of viewers and stuff. So it's like everybody's got like a different level of risk. So I just, some people really hate it, but like I'm used to it. So it's just like normal life for us. But like, if you're fine with that, it's it's really not that risky. Because again. We're going to want you to get something that's going to appraise for the right value. And then we're going to get through those humps, those bumps in the road. And when I do the analysis, I, I put in like CapEx. Okay. I put in your repairs and your maintenance, but just, just one thing too, like a lot of new investors, I'll, I'll put in there like repairs and maintenance and I'll estimate it. And I give you like the monthly and the yearly number. And it'd be like, let's just say it's like 120 bucks. Okay. We get investors that are new to the game and the, they will like, they will see that 120 and they will have like an expectation or an anticipation of like every month they're going to get like a $120 repair bill from us. And that's not how it would work. Like how it's going to work is like tenants will be placed into your unit and then tenants will live in your unit. And then like, say those tenants live there for four years, like you'd probably have like no repairs or very random minimal repairs over that four year period. But then when they move out, you know, you're getting like, a seven thousand dollar turnover right so like it's just like a way to illustrate like how you would budget it you no, get what no, I'm we saying? know that yeah, we know yeah. that okay yeah no we're comfortable with that i think and, yeah the, the one the the one thing is uh you know and dangerous or not dangerous right we, we've done a lot of a lot of reading and a lot of research um to the best of our ability right um and and admittedly so marina's done probably a lot more than i have um, but, but it came to one surefire conclusion that we both agreed on, right? Which is, we are not going to try and manage this on our own. We are yeah, not. Sure. Yeah. What I think this. after talking to you guys for the amount of time we've talked, I think what we're going to probably, what, what I think I will target for you guys, what I think will probably work the best for you guys is I'm going to target you guys, uh, some multifamily stuff in and around the hundred K range. Um, and I'm going to probably look at. Uh, probably Lorraine and Illyria, I would say. That's probably what I'm going to target for you guys. I like that uh, because you don't have as much uh, of the government coming in and bothering you with like the new lead sir laws that Cleveland has, which that's like a whole other topic of discussion. And those are, are very much in flux of how they're enforced because those are brand new laws that just came out. Uh, if you haven't seen my lead certification video, just just punch it I into YouTube. It. Yeah, so that's, that's did, big. Yeah. You don't really have to mess with that in Lorraine. Um, so I would say you really get the best, uh, like I like Lorraine and Illyria a lot and the price to rent ratios are basically what we've been talking about. And I think things are going to go like fairly smooth there and you don't run the risk of like big bills hitting you because sometimes the lead cert bills, uh, 
could be big. And then like whenever the government's extra involved, it just makes your life miserable. So based on what you guys are, are ready, willing and able to uh, deal with as far as the punches coming your way, I, I think uh, I would say Leary and Lorraine. Uh, duplexes, potentially quads would probably be where it's at. If it's a quad, it'd be like 200K, by the way, obviously. But I, I would say that's where we want to focus. And then you're going to be looking at a rent roll of around 1,700 every two units, about 850 a unit. And I think that would be uh, what you guys are into. And uh, that, yeah, that so that, that's how we'll do it. All right, cool. So any other questions before we get out of here? No, no. I appreciate you've gone over. I think you've got the hard wrap. Right from somebody, somebody said, "Hey, it's way you're going over here, man." Um, <laughs> yeah, Tom's so, in the back oh. with the sign, giving me the time. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. So okay, so today is like Tuesday. Uh, I would say probably, uh, probably next week, sometime next week, you'll get an email from me when I got a video for you, and I'll send you and be like, "Hey guys, here's uh the video I got for you," and then it'll be the private link. And uh, it's just going to be one of those MLS search and analysis shows. And it's going to be a property um, that I think will make sense for you. And like I said, I I'm thinking it'll probably be like a duplex or something like that in Lorraine County, Elyria, uh, or the city of Lorraine itself. I think something like that makes the most sense for you guys. And uh, I'll give you my my normal don't sugarcoat anything, give you the pros, give you the cons, and uh, discuss how we could put in the offer and uh, go from there. Perfect. Well, um, just just quickly, I'm looking at the calendar. Um, how far is Columbus from where you are? Two hours. Yeah. Yeah. So just so you know, too, when you watch Holton Wise TV, uh, Holton Wise, we 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 sell and service all of Ohio. Okay. Uh, but we only will do property management, uh, in Cuyahoga County and the counties that touch Cuyahoga County. So uh, yeah. if you wanted to buy Columbus real estate, uh, I could help you with analysis videos. I could be your broker when you bought it. I could even do your insurance because I'm a licensed insurance broker too. Uh, but you would need to outsource your property management and your construction services because it just goes back to a staffing issue. Sure. Uh, the reason I was asking was not about property. What was because there's a nuclear conference going on that one of one – of, uh, my colleagues has asked me to attend. Um, and so while I was out there, I was just wondering if it's worth my time to, uh, you know, if to come up to, to the Cleveland area and kind of take a look around. Obviously, I'm not going to be that guy that asked to come look inside a house, right? I'm not sure. going to be that guy. <laughs> uh, because I did see your video where you said not going to happen. Well, um, uh, well, to that point, if it's occupied, it won't happen. Uh, right. But if, if you're in Columbus and then you end up venturing up to the Cleveland market and you look at my investment properties for sale show, those are all the properties that uh, that Holton Wise is selling for other clients. Uh, if they're vacant, we'll get you in. You can get inside of them. That's We're all about transparency. Like we don't keep people out of them to avoid them seeing things. It's just we're not going to mess with the tenants. But yeah, if you ventured up to Cleveland and you wanted to actually go inside some of these homes, just send my team an email and we'll get you inside the vacant ones, not the occupied ones. But you go to the duplexes uh, where one unit's occupied, one unit's vacant. You could you could absolutely go inside the vacant unit. That won't be a problem. We'll get you in there. And uh, you'll right. be able to see, like, I don't know if, I don't believe we actually have any Columbus listings like today, but we might even have some in Columbus at the time you're out. Because we got stuff, Toledo, which is up by Detroit, Columbus, Youngstown, Cleveland. It's just if if you want the full service management with Holton Wise, it just geographically needs to be up in Cuyahoga County and surrounding it. But uh, yeah, you could absolutely get inside the uh, inside yes. these properties, and you should drive these neighborhoods. I, I mean, you're you're a former cop, former military guy, so I don't think you're really going to be in danger. You should drive to the F class neighborhoods, and uh, you know, just so you see. Like you see, like okay, I get why the houses sell for eight k over here, and then they sell for not eight k over here. I think you should definitely drive them. Why not? You're about you're thinking about spending a large amount of your money. I mean, yeah, do it. Yeah, so I was just thinking it might be nice to to kind of see you guys uh, face to face as well. So, um, but I'll send you I'll send you guys an uh, email on any other questions that we have because I I feel really bad we're taking so much of your time over, right? Hey, um, no problem. But um. But everything, just like I said, gold dust, James. I really appreciate all the time. I think we both do. Um, and thanks for making me look like a chump as well. Uh, and my wife is right and I'm wrong. 
Yeah. I mean, dude, you're you're already wrong. The moment you walked in on the call, you're married. I mean, this is how it is, man. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> All right, you guys have a great day, and uh, okay, I'll I'll be in touch you. next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll be in touch with you guys next week. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.